Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and it's great to be back. Um, so this is actually my second AlterConf. Um, unlike last year, I did not go first, so that's great for me. But um, I do think um, it's really great to be here. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Josh Lim. I am a community manager by profession. Um, I currently live in the Philippines, so I work as a community manager for a co-working space. But for the last seven years, I have been building the Wikimedia community in the Philippines, which is actually largely what my talk is going to be about today. So my talk is always go down fighting the case for failure as a tech community's strength. So the gist of it is that um, it's making a case for how failure can actually strengthen rather than destroy communities. Because as we know, we will always experience failure at least once in our lives. And so we should at least try our best to not let failure get the best of us, right? So let's see if I get this right. Okay, so as we know, whoop, wait, how does this work? Okay. So as we know, communities are made, built, grown in cycles. They will always have that initial burst of energy coming from groups of people who want to change the world, do something good for the communities that they want to build, which in turn leads to a growth phase, and then somewhere along the line you peak. But of course, everything does from there, sometimes things do go down afterward, and you have to realize that at one point you will slow down, you'll have to downsize, you'll lose people in your community, and then you fail. Um, as someone who has been in an open source community for, I think, 12 years now, um, you learn to realize as well, and I'll be paraphrasing one of the talks earlier, you eventually learn to get tired. Um, and you will um, start taking a look at everything that you've done over all these years, and have you really done something right? Or have you really thought about um, what it is that I am doing. And so these are things that we bear in mind every time we um, work with the communities that we're working with, trying to help the people that we're working with, and building the, um, the advocacy around the products that we promote. Um, many of us think that communities are like this. You know, friendly, friendly banter in a coffee shop. This is actually us in 2007, so 10 years ago. Um, when I was, I think, 70 pounds lighter. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just us talking about how we wanted to have, um, in this case, how we wanted to have Wikipedia be a, um, a force for good in, in this case, Philippine society. So this is actually us in a coffee shop in Manila talking about setting up an organization. Um, but this is relevant to experiences, not just in um, open source communities, but anywhere. Many of us tend to think that a lot of the work that we do, um, building communities, building products, building anything, is really just getting a group of people that have mutual interests involved um, and just going out there and building the thing. But other, but other times, you should consider, communities can also be this. You will run into rough water. Um, I guess at one point, we didn't consider um, that things would have happened so quickly, which I will talk about later in this presentation. But it always goes to show that it does a lot of good to look into things, excuse me, with a skeptical point of view, if I may say. Um, it's always good to want to look at what you've done and whether or not it really has done a lot of good for the people that you've worked with. And why do I ask that? That is because failure can be an integral part of building communities. Sometimes in order for us to really um, do the things that we love to do, and in order for us to continue doing the things that we love to do, we have to learn to stumble once in a while, to be humbled into um, thinking that somehow I am doing something wrong. And it never does anyone good in, no matter, no matter what you do, it never does you good if you think that you're always right. Um, and in fact, for me, it came a little bit sooner than others, and that was because two years ago, 
at Open Source Bridge 2015, I delivered a presentation on not running your organization into the ground. Um, quite literally, it was a presentation on how this was around the time that we were starting to slow down. So I uh, was the president for the local Wikipedia chapter in the Philippines, which is Wikimedia Philippines. And we were talking about how we wanted to make sure that when you have a tech organization, you don't do the same mistakes we did. Um, I actually went about and gave this slide, which was don't be afraid to actually fail. And I mentioned in that presentation that um, we should not allow failure to get the best of us. There will be times where we stumble, fall down, and we have to um, just do our best to pick up the pieces and move on. Um, of course, no one expects full things to go full circle. And so it happened in early 2017. Um, we lost our accreditation with the Wikimedia Foundation as an affiliate for the Philippines. And so for us, you know, in the community, it was devastating simply because it felt like a lot of the work that we were doing was invalidated. Um, a lot of the work that we were doing um, seems to have been thrown out the window, if you will, because we were unable to get paperwork done on time or we were unable to fulfill requirements. As I, mentioned, it is, um, as I mentioned in that presentation two years ago, it is extremely difficult to run an organization, um, especially an incorporated one. So we were incorporated in the Philippines, we had a lot of paperwork to take care of, and it is extremely difficult to just go through all of that every single year. Um, and as I look at it now, you know, it was to the detriment of the work that we could have done as a community to really build on our advocacy and to really build on the things that we really wanted to do. When people tell you you're a failure, you internalize it. You feel that a lot of the work that you've done is, as, you know, a lot of the work that you've done is irrelevant and the only thing that matters is that you were unable to do this one thing, which is to keep an organization up and running. You feel like you can't do anything else anymore because the work that you've, um, the things that come with having that status or the things that come with having that shiny bobble, if you will, that allows you to keep your organization up and running or your community up and running is what is important to the detriment of everything else. And so, whoops, hold on, and so, we have to consider that the shiny bobble is all that we have left. But when you look at it this way, I come from a developing country. I grew up in the United States, but I currently live in a country where, you know, we have grinding poverty, 32% of the, of the populations below the poverty line. You have a lot of people who are unable to go to school. You have a lot of people who are unable to participate in the advocacy of building communities simply because there are more basic things that they need to take care of. And so unlike places like here in the United States, it is much harder to build a community in many countries, including mine, simply because here we are extremely privileged. And I myself am from a privileged background, and I always carry that with me every time I work with the communities that I work with. It's always great to be mindful of the fact that we are so blessed to be here in the US to have, to not want, to not need to have to worry about finding a place to live, finding something to eat. Whereas, although yes, there are a lot of people who have to worry about that, it's certainly not as bad as where I have to, in places like where I live, um, where we have to be mindful of the fact that these are, that these are um, do or die situations for a lot of people. And so that makes it even more difficult for us to build critical mass and to find people to build the communities that we want to build. This is all too common in the developing world. We, um, for me, I like to break down failure um, in any organization as a result of four things. Capacity, motivation, critical mass, and support, in this case, support from other people. So on the one hand, we don't have the capacity to build an organization. We were actually about 10 active people and so our capacity was stretched quite thin. We were doing a lot of things. And even then, we were starting to tire of doing a lot of those same things. And so we were trying to constantly look for people. Building our critical mass would want to take over, and we were unable to do that. Um, especially since 
for a lot of people, and I guess that goes for a lot of, and I guess it goes for us in this room as well, a lot of us are probably afraid of wanting to run a legal organization and having all the responsibility that comes with that. Um, and so, as a result, you don't feel motivated enough to want to run these things, and you won't feel motivated enough to contribute to your community because you're just so busy thinking of how am I going to save my organization. And so, what happens there is that the whole thing collapses because you don't have enough people wanting to, um, to do the thing, and you don't have, um, and everyone just wants to leave the, you know, it's, a, it's like a car crash, a burning car crash, and you just want to leave. <laughs> if I may use that analogy. We had to learn how to move on and rebuild since January, um, since February 2017 when the decision came down. So how did we end up doing that? Um, so in the month since, we've been lying low. Um, we've been doing some activities. We've been promoting. Um, we've, we're still giving out workshops. We did a workshop in early November. Uh, I'm sorry, in, yes, in early November um, as part of a tie-up with another organization that seeks to um, combat historical revisionism. So in the Philippines, we have a lot of issues with fake news, with um, the glorification of our late dictator, Ferdinand Marcos. Um, and so we were trying to tie up with organizations to help, um, to help combat that because it was a particularly pernicious problem on Wikipedia. But for us, it was an exercise in trying to find our stride again and wanting to rebuild the things that we used to do, that we loved to do, um, and not think about having an organization holding us back. So the way that we did it was, we learned to downsize and be practical, first of all. So for now, largely the ones running our events are myself and a friend of mine, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Eugene Villar, who's on my, on my right here in the photo. Um, he, so we ran this event, he gave a couple of talks as well in the year, and, and so for us, it's really just having smaller events. We were no longer aiming to have 100, um, not even 100 people. Like, we were just aiming to have a small group, maybe 10 people who are really dedicated to wanting to edit Wikipedia. And so we use that to motivate ourselves to try and find what we love to do. In this case, teaching people how to edit and finding a purpose, in, on, uh, finding a purpose for why they should edit in the first place, which in this case, was uh, making sure that history is right. The second reason, uh, the second one is, whoop, let's skip there. We began to focus on what's important. Um, failure allows you to focus on things that are, um, that are at the core of what you do. So for us, we began to focus less on making sure our reports are done on time. Of course, we're still trying to make sure that we are in compliance and we want to return to compliance with regards to that, but we began to focus less on bureaucracy. We began to focus less on running an organization because there was no organization left to run. Um, and instead, we began to focus more on reaching the people that we need the most, um, doing impactful events, um, finding people who would want, who share our advocacy and wanting to contribute their knowledge to what we do. And finally, we did not let failure stop us from doing what we love. If anything, I guess for me, um, there was a whole year where I basically stayed low and kept quiet. I couldn't think about doing the things that I wanted to do, and this was such an integral part of my life that um, when we found out that we failed, you know, I was devastated. Um, and it was such a pain for me to have to deal with that. But I found that throughout this entire experience, it was very cathartic in that we learned to do all these things. But at the same time, I learned to find my love again for a community that I thought at one point, you know, I felt, I personally felt betrayed by what happened because I felt that a lot of the work that I have done over the last 10 years was just nothing because this was all that matters. Instead, what I ended up finding was, this was a way for me to really re-experience what it was like 
to do the work that I was doing before we put up the organization. So just finding, just meeting people, um, rebuilding our community, talking to the um, editors that make Wikipedia work in the Philippines and elsewhere, and holding one-off events that at least made some impact rather than just having to focus on metrics and numbers. Um, after all, right, we want to focus when it comes to building events, for example, like this one. I guess the focus is not just on the numbers, how many people you can pack in an auditorium, but whether or not we're really making meaningful change and having a meaningful conversation about the things that we do here and about the things that we are fighting for and want to fight for. If anything, failure taught us, and it taught me especially this, it strengthens communities because it helps put things into perspective. Um, it allowed me to reframe everything that I was thinking about, all my advocacy involving, um, involving open source, my advocacy for geographic diversity, so I'm particularly active in making sure that we get people from the developing world in, um, in the activities that we do. For example, for me, I flew 7,000 miles to come here. Um, so that's part of the work that I try to do to make sure that at least for us in developing countries, you know, you get to hear us as well. Um, we hear a lot about um, women fighting for more diversity, people from sexual minorities fighting for more diversity, other marginalized groups fighting for more diversity. Geographical diversity, at least for me, is also up there, and it's part of the reason why I try to be here as best as I can. Um, at the same time, it also allows us to really think about what is the best approach for us to build, um, to build the products that we do, to um, build the communities that we want to build. Is it fair, is, um, if you're in a community and most people don't want an organization, should you still have one? Um, and for us, we learned that, um, you know, we have benefits to having an organization. And, you know, those benefits are undeniably great for people that have them. But we also learned that sometimes the things that we need to do don't require having all that overhead or don't require having all the fancy gizmos and gadgets that you need in order to get, um, in order to do what you love, and in order to fight for the advocacy that you're fighting for. Um, and ultimately, I guess, it's also giving me the drive to continue fighting for what is right. Um, and I guess for everybody, it should also show that, you know, when you fail, um, it's never going to be the end of the world. It's going to, um, you can either choose to mope around all day and do nothing and just ignore the world around you, or um, you take stock of what happened, you fail, yet you fail at least gracefully, and you continue fighting for what you believe is right. Because... As they say, in order for you to do the right thing, you of course have to try several times before you get to what you have to do, well, before you get to the right thing, right? Um, and I guess for me, it's simply a matter of making sure that I'm hoping that what I'm doing now is the right thing to do. And I hope we all fail together. Thank you very much for listening to me ramble for I have no idea how long. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them. And let's fail together. Thank you so much. You mentioned the difference in privilege between a Western society working on open communities and, and a developing world. Do you feel the stakes of failure are higher for the developing world when it comes to participating in things like these than you know, the Western Hemisphere? I would think yes, and the reason for that is because in developing countries, you will often have a very limited pool of people from where you can build these communities in. Um, so let's say in the United States, okay, here at AlterConf, for example, we have a lot of people who are willing to fight for diversity and inclusion in tech, a lot of people um, that are willing to do that, and let's say if 5% of the people here are no longer in a position to fight for that, you still have a lot of people here and a lot of people who are not here to fight for that. 
in my situation, or in, even in other developing countries, I would reckon, you have, an even, you have a very small pool of people that are willing to fight for those things. Um, let's say, um, like, to use the Wikipedia community in the Philippines as an example, we only have about 400 active editors. I'm uh, sorry, we have 400 editors, and of those, of the super active ones, so those who edit at least 100, um, make 100 edits a month, I can count them with my fingers. So like 10, probably. That's not a lot of people that you have in order to build the community that you want to build and to fight for the advocacy that you want to fight for. So if any one of those drop out, and, the commu and for us, for example, the group is very tight-knit, we all feel it. And we all feel like we wouldn't want to continue working on it. So the stakes are definitely much higher. I, I found your, your talk brought up a lot of emotions. Um, and the one I, would, I most want to share with you is, is, is something of, of pride. Um, as a Filipino-American, I think that's, it's amazing that you decided to come here and to, to share uh, your experiences with us. I think it's really, really important. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, the, the Philippines is a, is a place where we do have a diaspora. And um, I'm wondering what, what we can do as Filipino Americans and as, as members of the Filipino diaspora in um, countries that are um, that have, have better access to um, you know social connections within uh, the, develop, the developed world. So um, I actually am Filipino American myself, um, so it's great to see other fellow Filipino Americans here. Um, but. Unfortunately for me, I'm not as in tune with the community. I guess it's, um, I grew up in a place where we only had 2,000 Filipino Americans. Um, and the community is not that tight knit. Um, but if you ask me, I do think that there are many ways for diaspora communities to contribute to um, efforts in their home countries. So I'll, I'll try to generalize the question here. Um, the question was um, how would diaspora, how could diaspora communities um, contribute to efforts back home. And for me, I think that there are two ways to do that. Number one, um, I do think that a lot of, so to talk about it in tech terms, a lot of tech that makes it to developing countries come from people who are part of the diaspora. So for example, the reason why um, the reason why, for, uh, and I'll use an older example, Friendster became popular in the Philippines was because a Filipino-American or a Filipino working in the United States brought it to the Philippines and told her network in the Philippines, hey, use this, I'm on it, everyone else is going to be on it, so you should too. Um, so it could work that way. I think it's really just fostering support for that aside from just telling people go on it. Um, it's really spur, um, sometimes we want to take a, we should take a more active approach to building tech communities in developing countries as members of the diaspora. Because we are in the position to be more in tune with what's going on in home, in places like the United States as opposed to there, where we're trying to do the reverse. The second one that I think, that I can think of is we want um, to, uh, we want to try to support people in developing countries by providing opportunities for them. Um, so it's the reverse in this case. We want them to have opportunities to come here, to learn from what we have here in the developed world, and for them to bring those lessons back. And I think that the diaspora can play a very strong role in doing that. I have less than one minute. I could take one more question, but if I have no time, feel, please feel free to tweet me. Um, that is, my Twitter handle is not on there, but I have been tweeting during AlterCon. If you'll find me, I'm at Akistar. Um, and thank you again, and I hope you enjoyed me rambling for the last 25 minutes. <laughs>